right, well, hello and welcome everyone to the Drilling in Nevada panel hosted by SIX. I'm pleased to introduce our panelists today. We have Caleb Stroop, President and CEO at Headwater Gold, Matthew Lennox King, President and CEO at Contact Gold, Cherie Leiden, CEO of Gold Bowl, and Chad Peters, President, CEO, and Director at Ridgeline Minerals. Welcome, everyone. Um, before we jump into the discussion, I want to remind everyone that you can submit your questions at any time using the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of the screen, and we will get to them um, for a live Q&A after the discussion. And as always, the summit is being recorded and will be available to watch afterwards on six.com. So just to kick things off, um, it'd be great if we can just start with a brief introdu introduction from each panelist about yourselves and your company. So uh, starting with you, Caleb. Sure. Uh, I, I'm Caleb Stroop. I'm president and CEO of Headwater Gold. I'm a geologist. I'm based here in Reno, Nevada. Uh, in, in Nevada is where I've spent the majority of my career in the precious metal exploration space, uh, both with junior companies and major mining companies. Uh, I started Headwater about three years ago as a, a, a early stage precious metal exploration company focused on high grade vein projects. Uh, predominantly in Nevada, but also throughout the Western U.S. We have projects in uh, Nevada, Idaho, and Far Eastern Oregon. Uh, the company completed a listing, uh, completed a listing in uh, June of this year. Uh, and since then, we've been rather busy. We've drilled two projects. We just completed drilling on a, a, the second one. These are the Highland and Spring Peak Epithermal Vein projects in Nevada. Uh, and we have plans to drill uh, two more projects before the end of the year. That's all in keeping with our uh, overall goal of being fairly active, drilling something like three to five projects every year out of a large portfolio of projects that we maintain. We, we like to have something like 10 projects in the portfolio at any given time. Uh, and, and that's really made possible because the majority of our projects are generated internally and therefore are 100% owned and, and either royalty free or have a very minimal royalty burden. Uh, so, so that's the approach that we take. Uh, we think we've got a, a, a quality team, quality portfolio in a, a great jurisdiction, obviously, and a solid exploration strategy. Uh, and, and we're trading on the CSE under the symbol HWG and on the OTC uh, under HWAUF. Great, thank you so much. And Matthew. Great, thanks, Dasha. Um, morning, everybody. Uh, so Matt Lennox King, President and CEO of Contact Gold. Uh, like uh, my colleagues here on uh, the summit, we are 100% uh, focused on the great state of Nevada. Uh, principally, we are exploring our Green Springs project, uh, which is a high grade oxide project really in uh, East Central Nevada. This is in a, it's in an active district. It's relatively close to uh, Kinross's Bald Mountain Mine. It's adjacent to Fiore Gold's Pan Mine and Gold Rock Development Project. Um, and we, we've been actively exploring there for the past two years. Uh, we recently wrapped up a really successful drill program at Green Springs. Uh, it saw three new oxide gold discoveries. Um, which we think is pretty remarkable given we are we are working at an old mine site, but we think that's a real indication of the potential uh, that we have to uh, deliver ultimately some meaningful high quality gold deposits uh, at Green Springs. Uh, we are based in Vancouver. Uh, we trade here in Canada on the TSX Venture Exchange and in the US uh, on the OTCQB uh, CGOLF. That's Contact Gold and look forward to, I'm really looking forward to the summit today. I'm also looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, Matthew uh, and Sheree. Thank you, Dasha. Uh, Sheree Leiden here, also based in Nevada and focused on the Great Basin. A geologist originally, first 10 years boots on ground, the second 10 years more corporate kind of role. And uh, I co-founded Gold Bull with our chairman, Craig Parry, about a year ago now. Uh, our first asset um, was uh, an acquisition from Newmont called Sandman. And Sandman boasts a half a million ounce resource uh, at the moment. And where we see the real upside is really uh, exploring beneath the top 100 metres at Sandman and really looking for the high grade and multi million ounce potential feeders of that project. Uh, in addition to Sandman, we've also got a, a couple of early stage exploration projects, high risk, high reward kind of plays that are, are drill ready now. We hope to drill them in quarter four. And we're also on the hunt for additional acquisitions, um, whether it's by mergers or acquisitions. 
Great, thank you. And last but not least, Chad. Yeah, we're uh, four geos on the panel. That's the first time I think I've ever seen that, Dasha. So nice work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm uh, Chad Peters, CEO of Ridgeline uh, Minerals. Uh, we are, again, yeah, just like everybody else, Nevada-focused uh, exploration company where we focus primarily on um, carlin-type deposits, or at least that's how we founded the company. Um, in reality, we've actually discovered a CRD uh, system in our Selena project, which we'll get into maybe in a bit, but um, where you have 154 square kilometers across four projects, um, core land positions adjacent to some of the biggest mines in Nevada and on trend of those mines. And um, I think one of the things that maybe sets us apart as a company is when, when I co-founded the company with my partner, Steve Nielsen, um, he's the owner of a drilling company. So the whole focus was putting money in the ground early advancing these projects aggressively in the early stages and hopefully making a discovery early. Um, we've been able to do that at our Selena project with a new CRD uh, silver gold type uh, polymetallic system that's still we're still figuring out as we go here, but it's looking pretty exciting. Um, and then on top of that, we've drilled uh, well over 12,000 meters in the last uh, 18 months across all three, three of our four projects. Um, so trying to move these things forward and make discoveries. So that's uh, Ridgeline in a nutshell. Great. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, we have lots to discuss today, but to just start the conversation, what is it about the state of Nevada that is so attractive from an economic and business operations standpoint? Um, and can I throw it to you, Caleb, to start? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, I mean, it's no secret that Nevada is always ranked uh, either the top global jurisdiction or among the top three or so. Uh, and I think the big components are, uh, you know, there's three things that really go into those rankings. One is the, the gold endowment. Uh, you know, what are, what are your probability of, uh, of success actually finding something meaningful? Uh, you know, and the other big thing is the, the regulatory and political framework. Obviously, being in the U.S., things are fairly stable relative to, to other jurisdictions in the world. Uh, and, and Nevada also boasts sort of like, you know, uh, a well-established mining culture, both you know, with respect to the local communities and workforces, and so that that all all of that stuff fits into you know making it sort of the perfect place to explore. Great, thank you. Anything to add, Matt? Um, you know, not a lot. I, th I think Caleb really summed it up in a nutshell. I, I think the other things that you know, if you just layer on top of that a little bit, would be. There's good availability in normal times um, of drilling contractors, assay labs, environmental services companies. You know, you, it's it's really a one-stop shop. Um, it's very rare that you need something as an exploration company or even a development company that you can't actually find locally in Nevada and probably even on a smaller scale um, out of a town like Elko, Winnemucca, Reno. Uh, they're, they're all really well established, and, and that really helps. Great, Jerry. Do you, uh, what are your thoughts? I'll just add the livability. You know, most of us on this panel live choose to live here, and there's not many companies where the CEO is living where the projects are. So that's the real bonus that we can drive to our projects. Right. I hear the weather is nice. I haven't been, uh, Chad. Smoky, but nice. Uh, okay. Honestly, honestly, I don't have a whole lot to add. Actually, uh, I was listening to. Craig Perry's interview just the other day, actually, Sheree, um, and he mentioned that, you know, what they look at is is three things when they look at any project, size of the prize, cost of the test, and chance of success. I think Nevada is one of the only jurisdictions worldwide where you can easily answer all three of those questions very quickly and efficiently. So um, that's why we're here. Great. Okay. All right. Well, I'll throw this one to you, Chad, so we can uh, make sure that you got a chance to speak. But um, how do you think the federal and local governments view mining? in Nevada and have there been any major changes since the new administration took over earlier this year? I think there was some some real concern back in 2020 or early 2020 regarding um, some new tax uh, taxes that were being imposed or potentially being imposed um, could have been a massive uh, blow to the industry they, they were proposing almost like a seven percent additional tax um, so that was at the local level not at the at the federal level um, but and I so I think that luckily we were able to avoid a major um, tax burden there was an additional kind of tax levied on producing companies in Nevada um, but it's not enough to put most mines out of production so um, at the federal level I haven't seen anything really that's changed all that much um, at the state level I think we dodged a bullet but yeah it's still fairly uh, fairly good spot to be working Great. Sherry? I thought, um, you know, the tax that was introduced last year was could have been handled better with, with more yeah. consultation with industry. So I was pretty disappointed regarding how that new state tax was born. Um, federally, 
I um I also have some concerns. Uh, we're already seeing some of the power at the local level and BLM offers be shifted to DC. And um, there's a couple of bills floating around that I hope are squished before they make it you know, a- a- anywhere um, because there's, there's some anti-mining um, rhetoric and royalties contained within them. So uh, I think it's something to watch. And um, I, I do hope that federally we get the support because locally in Nevada, it is a pro-mining state. Uh, and um, you know we've got a supportive governor and you know, world-class environmental regulations. Uh, so I, I'm a fan of the state. It's um it's the federal level that I hope um, see the importance of mining to the economy and to being able to source critical minerals as well. Right, absolutely. Matt, what are your thoughts? Yeah, my, look, my uh, my answers are roughly in line with everybody else's, and I'd even maybe take a step back to to 2016. Um, you know that that's right when contact was going public, and, and honestly, we didn't see much fluctuation even through the previous administration. Now, now under the Biden administration, just as it impacts our day to day, exploring first at our Pony Creek project, now at our Green Springs project, it's always, you know, our our group. Um, you know, we have a long history in Nevada, like the other guys on the call here, and and it, it's always been a great place to work. Yeah, there can be some little fluctuations along the road, but it's it's always pretty stable it's always supportive and ultimately if you're doing things right you're going to have success great thank you and caleb any last thoughts yeah obviously i agree with all of that i think you know the the one thing that nevada has uh that is somewhat unique is we are home to you know some of the world's biggest mining companies running some of the world's biggest mines so any changes would have to affect them as well and uh that would be very high profile and we can you know uh, uh, benefit from a little bit of cover from from these big companies right okay great well um i was wondering what are the factors that make a junior mining company successful in nevada um can i throw this one to you Matt? sure thing yeah absolutely so um you know as in any jurisdiction i, I think that really the key things are who's on the team you know, do they have good foundation? And if we're talking about exploration of Nevada geology, what the opportunities are, what the risks are, like really how, how do you explore? Because you know, the, the exploration in an environment in Nevada is certainly different than in Northern Canada, Turkey, West Africa, right? You're, you're in a somewhat unique geologic environment. Um, I do think having um, the experience in the state so you know how to navigate the permitting and environmental regime it's very well laid out, but it's a, it can also be time consuming. Um, and then a good understanding of how land title works, because it's very different than in Canada. Um, you know, you have multiple types of mining lands from private lands to checkerboard to BLM claims to US Forest Service. Um, and having good support on the land front can one, help you establish really good property position, two, keep your land in good standing, uh, and three really help with uh, with the permitting side of things, um, and then of course you need a lot. I think you need a large consolidated uh, land position underlain by favorable geology. Um, and if you, you have all those factors, I think if if there's a deposit there to be found, uh, you'll you'll be successful. Great, Caleb. Okay, what do you think, Caleb? Yeah, I think uh, Matt touched on it there. I think uh, having a strong local presence is pretty important uh, in Nevada because, uh, you know, it's fairly straightforward to work here, but there are a lot of local intricacies that, uh, you know, can trip people up who come from other places in the world. Uh, I think all of us here have made uh, great efforts to to build local teams and uh, understand how things work on the ground. And in general, the, the geological community of Nevada is very welcoming and there's a lot of you know, uh, uh, people that are available for support. You just need to know who to reach out to and, and who to to lean on there. Great, thank you. Sheree? Uh, I would add access to capital. Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of great companies with great projects and great people that just can't find the money to advance them. So to really um, to have that uh, ability and a supportive shareholder base that are willing to back a high risk, high reward, um, scientific concepts. Um, to, ke- to keep the companies well funded. Obviously, the more drill holes, the more chance of success. Great. Anything we missed, Chad? 
Cherie stole my answer. So, uh, <laughs> um, no, I agree a hundred percent. And like, um, it is, I think really actually in Nevada, it is being local is a major, or at least having experience. You don't have to be local, but you do need to have experience here. I was part of 8 million ounces of discovery in Canada back through 2012, moved down here and had no idea what I was doing. Like, it's just a totally different world. The, everything behaves differently. Um, and I think that, um, you know, we see right now probably every one of the groups on, or every company on this panel will look back and kind of laugh at the projects that are being picked up by, you know, Canadian juniors, Australian juniors um, that have been hit 100 times, named three different names in the last three bull markets and are now being spun back out of the different companies. Right. And you see those and you, well, any one of us wouldn't even touch it with a 10 foot pole. And I think that's where having that local understanding of, of the projects and the geology really shines through. You see quality projects being run by quality companies. Great, thank you. So obviously, yeah, Net Nevada is very active and busy right now. I was wondering, what are some of the challenges that come with that? And again, what are some of the benefits of a bull market in regards to rig availability and assay labs, services, jobs? Um, I want to open the floor to a more active discussion. So whoever wants to take it away. It's been kind of looking for a jury. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Sherry. Yeah, so we're, we're looking for a jury right now. Um, we've certainly seen quality slip with some of our um, in drilling providers. Labs turnaround times have slipped. Um, so I don't think that's really uh, localized to Nevada. I'd, I'd say that's global right now. So it's just, again, comes back to being local and having those relationships with the drilling companies and, and the labs. Um, you know, hopefully that, that puts us in good stead, but certainly there is, um, there is a shortage of good drillers um, and lab turnarounds have been impacted. And that's largely due to COVID uh, really taking out some of the, um, the, the lower price labor out of the workforce because they've been getting paid not to go to work. So why turn up? Um, to a job. So I think um, now we're seeing a lot of the stimulus reduce. Uh, I think the labor shortage should improve. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I remember um, like I called I called for a drilling contractor in March. Uh, that, to be clear, uh, we have the RC covered with our contract, but we don't have a core rig with our, our drilling contract. So I started calling around for core rigs in March, looking for June or July start. And probably the first five people I called that I've known for maybe eight years, they just laughed at me and said, I got a rig available either in October, November, or 2022. And this was giving four months advance, three months advance notice. Um, give it even 18 months before that, 12 months before that, you could have called and had five different companies competing for your bid. So it's been a dramatic change. Like Sheree said, quality of work has dropped dramatically. Um, I had five guys I requested for the program I finally was able to get going, five drillers I'd worked with, not one of them was on my project. I would, so new drillers, um, you know, productions dropped, costs have skyrocketed and across the core space, especially. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a tough, it's, it's a double edged sword. We got a great market right now, but we're also struggling to, to do meaningful exploration on some of these deeper uh, targets, which require specific drill companies and rigs. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think that that's the big thing is rig availability. Assay lab turnaround is slow, but uh, it's a little bit more manageable. If you don't have a drill rig, you can't send anything to the lab. Uh, and it, it seems that it's a labor crunch issue for the most part. There are drill rigs sitting without crews on projects yeah. that I know of. So uh, it's a combination of increased demand and, as Sheree pointed to, a, a, just a lack of, uh, of people willing to, to work in these challenging conditions. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I think one one thing that we've and I agree with everything that you guys are saying. One thing, one area we've been a bit lucky is that at our Green Springs project, just because of where we are, we're a bit lower elevation. Our weather is you know, knock on wood has been a bit better, so we've been able to drill maybe not at the busiest times. Um, last year we ramped up late February. We drilled through to the end of May. Um, rig availability was pretty decent, so we're we're looking to kind of mirror that for our next program coming up here either late November, December, or, or maybe into, into January and, and try and take advantage of being able to drill essentially off uh, off the busy times. Uh, on the labor shortage issue, Kayla, I'm talking to an Aussie drilling company called Mitchell at the moment, and they're, um, they've just purchased drillerless rigs, like basically they're, they're remote control rigs. They don't require drillers and offsiders. So it's going to be interesting to see how the industry also evolves due to these labor shortages. And obviously, yeah. they, that also comes with a bunch of safety advantages. There's you know, no safety mm -hmm. issues when there's a person on the rig. Yeah, super interesting. 
Okay, well, I want to get more into each of your specific projects. So what do you believe differentiates your project from other junior explorers as an investment opportunity? And I'm going to throw it to you, Sherry. So I'll focus on Sandman. So Sandman's got a half a million ounces that's already been defined, predominantly sitting close to the surface, um, average grade of 0 0.7 grams per tonne, most of it oxide. So I'd say that that really limits our downside. We know we've got half a million ounces. Uh, another massive advantage of Sandman is that we've got a plan of operation, uh, which is a really comprehensive uh, environmental permit that allows us to serve up to 500 acres. And um, in the, per the permitting aspects, um, is, uh, I guess, what we really focus on uh, when we look at projects for acquisition and how easy or hard is it going to be to actually advance projects to production. So to have uh, 500 acres that's already been uh, comprehensively surveyed, both um, from an environmental perspective, water perspective, cultural perspective, it's just such a massive bonus for us. Uh, otherwise, that permit could take years and it may not even be possible to the extent that uh, we have inherited that permit from Newmont. So um, I'd say that that just allows us to basically drill um, in where we want under that plan of operation. So the half a million ounces backing um, our current market cap plus a plan of operation to allow us to really go attack and look for another sleeper style deposit uh, under you know under the, the top 100 metres. Um, that's where we're at right now for um, Goldpool. And uh, we're hoping to get one of these rigs that's becoming available in November um, because we are also at, at relatively low elevation, we can drill 12 months a year. So as of November, we should start um, producing some news flow and drill results, uh, targeting these sleeper conceptual bonanza style targets. Great, thank you. Chad? Uh, yeah, I'd, I'll probably start with uh, our Selena project. That's our, our active discovery that we made in 2020. Um, that's turning into a pretty interesting, we thought we had a silver gold um, system and, and we actually started hitting more CRD type mineralization towards the end of our, our most recent drill program. So lots of potential, it's sitting right beside a known porphyry system. So what we're kind of targeting right now is, is like an Arizona mining type Taylor um, CRD deposit. That thing started as a, as a lower grade silver open pit called Hermosa. They drilled beneath it and down strike of it and they found a world class CRD deposit. So um, I think our last program we drilled 44 meters of 130 grams per ton silver equivalent. So it was 123 grams silver, 0.1 gold. And then, uh, which we didn't include in the silver equivalent, included a percent and a half lead and 0.7% zinc. Um, so that's, you know, you look at that from a gold silver perspective, that's a gold equivalent of about 1.8 grams per ton in today's prices. So we know we have something there and I think um, we're going to keep advancing that. It definitely backstops our stock. And then on top of that, we have some really core land positions against uh, downstrike of some of the biggest mines in Nevada. So our SWIFT project is 75 square kilometers on trend of the pipeline mine, same host rocks, same general structural trend, um, very little drilling. And then we're actually drilling at our Carlin East project right now. That's uh, directly on trend of Nevada Gold Mine's new North Legal Discovery. So they're only about a kilometer and a half away from the edge of our project now, drilling along the same fault structures that hosts um, the Leeville and North Legal Discoveries. Um, that project, I'll be honest, the drilling is a nightmare there. It's We're drilling a thousand meters down. It's expensive. It falls into every single, you know, troubling issue that was brought up earlier in this, this panel. So, um, we're muscling through it and we'll hopefully have some results soon. But I think we offer some exposure to some really blue sky opportunities at those projects, as well as a, a nice backstop at Selena for the valuation of the company. Great. Thank you. Caleb? Yeah, well, a key point for us is that we're uh, actively working on numerous projects at, at, at any given time. Uh, so we're, we're drilling uh, hopefully four projects this year with the idea of putting our exploration dollars in the best targets throughout the portfolio, uh, you know, uh, to, to diversify the risk, the exploration risk. Diversification is a, you know, a key component of investing, and we uh, take that into the exploration world as well. It's a high-risk game, and, and to the extent that we can mitigate risk, it'll improve our probability of success in, in the future here. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're drilling high-impact high epithermal vein targets. So. Uh, if we're successful, uh, we'll hit something high grade and that will generate some attention. And if not, we'll, we'll move on and, and keep the ball rolling. Thank you. And Matt? Great, thanks. Um, so I'll borrow a bit of what Chad was saying earlier, really, you know, the four of us, and I think our respective companies, you know, we're all geologists by background. We have established teams and the projects that all of us are exploring and ours too, of course, that we've all selected them. It'll be, we'd be rigorous, we know the state, we know the geology, we know where really those key opportunities lie. 
Um, so that led contact to first to Pony Creek, which we still hold, and that, that really backstops us in a way, uh, and ultimately to Green Springs. And I think really what sets us apart in many ways um, is that we're drilling brand new, well oxidized, high grade gold discoveries at surface. Um, uh, on one of the major trends, albeit at the southern end. And, and that's pretty unique in today's day and age. Um, we're not drilling 1,000-meter holes. We're drilling 150-meter holes uh, and hitting new discoveries at multiple horizons. And I, I think that really speaks to the opportunity that we have. Um, we all know that you, know, you can mine in Nevada at very low grades and make fantastic margins whether we're at $1,500 gold, $1,800 gold. Uh, and I think that really sets the state apart. And I think the opportunities that certainly we're exploring, uh, but the other panelists are exploring as well, really speak to that. Um, high quality deposits, even at decent grade, doesn't have to be high grade, that turn into those really key cash generating assets for uh, mid-size and, and major size companies. And, and that's one of the reasons Nevada is is so attractive from a business point of view. Great, thank you. Yeah, I mean, you kind of segued into my last question here is uh, what should investors be excited about in Nevada? Um, and then we'll go into uh, these attendee questions because I see there's a lot coming up here. But um, Caleb, do you want to start? Yeah, well, I think there's a lot to be excited about. Uh, you know, new discoveries is a simple answer, and uh, you know, uh, potential acquisition stories. Uh, you know, we, we may be seeing the M and A space heating up a little bit. There was a, a big, you know, half a billion dollar acquisition relatively recently here uh, by Anglo Gold in Nevada. Uh, so uh, I think no matter what, success will be rewarded here, and uh, investors will benefit from that if if any one of us is successful. There's a market for advanced opportunities in Nevada, for sure, among the majors and mid-tiers. Great, thanks. And Matt, I know you mentioned some things, but... Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I do think Caleb's right. I think that Nevada recently, uh, for whatever reason, and I suspect maybe, maybe it's grade-related, I think a lot of the retail investing public has been focused on higher higher grade stories like you'd see in Ontario with Great Bear or some of the things in Newfoundland. Um, and I think the M&A that Caleb is referring to, whether it's the Anglo Gold deal uh, with Klondex, whether it's I-80 Gold buying up an autoclave and, and some assets from uh, from Waterton, you know, I think that shines a light on Nevada. And I think as that happens, people will make the realization that there's high quality work being done, there are high quality discoveries being made, um, and perhaps the the market's perception of Nevada will catch up to the industry's perception of Nevada, which I think I think there there's an arbitrage uh, at the moment between the two. Great, thank you. Sheree? Not a lot left to say. I think Kayla and Matt did a great job uh, and just you know, re-emphasizing that over here, you know, 0 0.3 grams a ton gold is currently economically feasible to extract, presuming, you know, presuming it's oxide and near the surface. So it's just unbelievable the amount of mines that are actually making significant money mining 0 0.3 grams a ton. So that's um, that's something that the ASX hasn't caught on to. It's something that the TSX is catching on to now. Uh, I'm also a director for, for Hog Ranch, um, owned by Rex Minerals, and there's 2 million ounces of 0 0.45 gram a ton and on the ASX is a perception that it's not economic. They don't see that that's potentially a billion dollar uh, mine. So I do think um, there'll, well, there'll be more education as the gold price stays pretty strong around 1800 that we can really profit from some pretty low grade numbers in this state. Great, thank you. And Chad? Yeah, no, agreed. Like we're hitting on absolutely that the low grade potential for for all of us is there, you know, that we can find economic deposits here in Nevada. But I think that's really what something is happening too, is you're seeing a lot of companies focusing on hitting old districts that have been forgotten about in Nevada, drilling deeper, drilling under old systems, under old mines, and they're having success. Um, you look at what's happened in the BD, you know, Corvus area with the new, you know, with Anglo and all of them picking up Corvus. Um, so I think there's going to be a huge um, push for deeper, um, deeper covered exploration under in known districts in Nevada as well as shallow stuff. I mean, obviously, if I can choose something that's outcropping its surface, I'm going to drill it all day long. But I think some of the big wins in Nevada are going to come from deeper covered targets. Um, and uh, hopefully, at least all it takes is one big discovery from a junior, I think, to really put that into um, perspective for the market and hopefully get people excited about Nevada again. 
Great. Well, thank you all so much. I want to jump into some attendee questions because there are a bunch here. Um, so this will be like open format. Whoever wants to answer, feel free. Um, Ronaldo is asking, what about environmental permits in Nevada? How long does it take to get a project to be fully permitted to ramp up? To ramp up, yeah. But, but um, it really depends on so many factors, such as what the land tenure is. Is it private? Is it BLM? Is it forestry? It depends if you have any sensitive species, any cultural sites, um, any sage grouse um, priority habitat. So um, it, there's not like a, a stock standard answer. I'd say the best case scenario, uh, it takes a, a minimum really of on the ground surveys of 12 months. Um, I'm not talking about early stage exploration, I'm talking the permanent project, but you need 12 months of water monitoring of biological surveys. Uh, and then um, once you've done all those surveys, you submit it to the agency. Um, an EA takes a minimum of six months, an EIS takes a minimum of, of 12 months for the agency to really scrutinise all that data. And then you start getting into the public um, comment and are able to move forward. I'm presuming everything looks fine. Um, the, the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection does an amazing job. They have world-class experts with respect to environmental regulations. It's probably one of the most regulative um, jurisdictions on the planet. So environment comes first and companies such as ours have to bond before we disturb. So if there's, if there's a company that ever wanted to run away or went bankrupt, the government already has our bond money to reclaim and rehabilitate uh, any surface disturbance that is done by exploration companies. Yeah, and I think like, you know, if you were to try to summarize, just put it in a nutshell, I mean, the best companies in Nevada, the Barracks and Newmonts, they can expect to be in full production three to five years, in three to five years or quicker if they're really lucky. Um, five to seven is probably more the standard. And if you're talking about, you know, from discovery to first gold pour, you could be 10 to 15 years. So, um, you know, in, rea in reality, you, know, you might see five years of exploration and, and development before you even go into the permitting stage. So it's, um, I mean, it's, it can be daunting at times, but it's, you know, it's pretty similar to a lot of other areas, um, you know, nation or in the, you know, globally, as far as permitting goes. So, um, I mean, I permitted in mine, I re-permitted an old mine when I worked for Premier Gold Mines at the Cove Deposit. That took three years to get the mine permit in place and really all the stuff, all the monitoring, everything was still there and it took, still took three years. And I've been gone from Premier for three years. They still haven't, uh, you know, they still haven't started their decline. So I think it shows that, you know, things can take a while um, in the state for sure. So I, I think a key point there though, too, is uh, that I'm not aware of a, a, a single truly economic gold deposit in Nevada that has not been developed for environmental or permitting reasons. Yeah. There may be headaches along the way, but uh, there, there's a, a pathway and a mechanism to get these things into production, and that's then proven out. Yeah, I think that's a really important point, Caleb, that, that there's a process. Uh, it's well prescribed. It's easy to understand. Um, and, and they're you know, regular check-ins along the way. So that at the end of the day, when you come out the end of the process, you, you, have, a, you have a rock solid permit um, that's not gonna be overturned down the road by lawsuits or anything else. It's, it is a very stable and secure process at the end of the day. And you have a plan of operations, don't you, Matt? I know Sheree does as well. We do, yeah, we have a plan on both our projects. So Pony Creek, we did that. That took a bit longer uh, than it typically would. Um, took almost three years, typically a plan of operations. And just for the attendees, that's your, call it your, your more advanced, robust uh, exploration permit. Uh, you've done your envi environmental baseline work, you've done archeology span work, and, and really cleared your site for exploration. Um, and that's really, that's really, you call it the gold standard for, for exploring in Nevada. So we have one at Pony Creek. Uh, and then when we acquired our Green Springs project, it, it came with a full plan of operations. So right out of the gate, we were able to be, uh, well, fully permitted and a lot more aggressive with uh, where we went with the drill out of the gate. Yeah, we just submitted a plan of operations at our Selena project. My only regret is we didn't do it eight months ago. So, sure. yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right, Tom is asking, how close is anyone um, to a proven deposit or are, are they all inferred? Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump in. So at Green Springs, I'd say we're a minimum of 12 months away uh, from resources. And, and the reason is you know, we, with our new discoveries there, we've really shifted our uh, focus from exploring what we call the old mine trend so the old Green Springs mine was active in the late 80s to stepping out into into new areas, new target areas uh, that we've um, 
defined or, or uh, compiled over the last couple of years. And, and as we step through those with the drill, we're making new discoveries and, and those are the obvious places to keep exploring and keep expanding. So at Gold Bull, at our Sandman project, we have a defined resource of 494,000 ounces and the majority, I think uh, 433,000 ounces is in the indicated category and about 60,000 ounces odd um, is in the inferred category and that's based off about 2,000 drill holes. So we've got a you know, high level of certainty um, in that resource. Yeah, we're on the um, we're on the on the lower confidence range so far, Selena. We got thirty six drill holes across the deposit. Um, we're taking a bit of a different approach. We're not so much focused on defining a resource at this stage. Um, we've done all the internal you know work on our own, modeled out the system. We believe we could comfortably go out and target you know a forty to sixty million ton or million ounce um, silver resource at uh, oak cropping at surface at Selena. But with the results we're hitting down dip with these polymetallics, I would rather prove scale, show that you have a much larger system. Uh, kind of butting up to the edge of that that open pit, and um, so yeah, we're we're taking that approach. Which um, when we get to a resource, that'll be great. But I don't anticipate one anytime soon. Yeah, yeah. At Headwater, a few of our projects uh, have you know drill indicated historic gold resources that we don't uh, put much credence into. We're really looking for the the high grade feeder zones to these things, and uh, you know, uh, barring success there, maybe we'll reconsider some of the lower grade components, but. That's not a, uh, a focus of ours now. Great, thank you. Um, so Wayne is saying, while he totally agrees with you all on the merits of being in Nevada, he's curious to hear your thoughts on why the market has not rewarded junior exploration stocks with Nevada-based assets, especially given the year, the very robust junior market uh, that you've had in the, the past year. Yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> hi, Wayne. Um, <laughs> I'm happy to, to jump in again and to repeat some of what I said uh, maybe 10 minutes ago. Um, I think that a lot of the um, a lot of the torque in the market's being generated uh, by people investing in high grade stories, um, whether it's the Newfoundland stuff, whether it's something like Great Bear in Ontario, and typically. You know, unless unless we're talking about some of the systems that, that Caleb is exploring at the moment, you don't typically see those really high splashy grades in Nevada. You tend to see higher margin rock, as Cherie was saying, you know, down to 0.3 grams. Uh, but that material, even if you're being successful, even if you're making those discoveries, typically doesn't make good headline material for press releases. Um, it, I think that has a lot to do with it. Um, you know, we, we would need to go back probably to 2015, 2016, when Gold Standard Ventures had a $900 million market cap um, to see junior exploration results really get torque in the market. And, and what they were drilling at the time was pretty exceptional. It was anywhere two to four grams over 100 plus meters. Uh, that's exciting no matter where you are. Um, so I, I think uh, I, th I think it's the nature of Nevada deposits. But but that said, as, as we've all seen over the years, you know, jurisdictions switch on and off as far as being in the spotlight or you know or or, or torquey. Um, that that shifts all the time. Great, thank you. Um, unless there's anything anyone wants to add and go. Well I, th I think it's worth mentioning too about Nevada um, just quickly is is it is one of those places where you get companies from all over the world looking for that Nevada kind of Nevada premium as people like to call it right so when a bull market comes in you get a lot of poorly run companies um, wasting shareholder dollars doing bad exploration maybe hitting those same projects that the four of us would never touch and putting three million bucks into it and, and finding nothing so I think there is Nevada has a bit of a can have a bit of a stigma at times in the bull market where you get almost too much noise, right? There's too many companies doing too much shitty work. And sorry for the language, poor work. <laughs> um, I've been living at home too long um, here in the pandemic. Um, but I think that's part of it. It's not, you know, but there is this issue with too many companies that are kind of um, diluting the space in Nevada. A lot of low grade, a lot of broken stories. And I think when you factor that in, like with Matt was saying, getting lost with some of the higher grade going on elsewhere in the world, it, it can make it sometimes tough to, uh, I guess, educate shareholders on what you're doing and why you're doing it differently. Um, our Selena project, I've had to push that uphill for a year and a half now. Um, 
you know, people go, I don't understand open pit silver deposits. And I go, well, up to a year and a half ago, I didn't either, but this is actually pretty exciting <laughs> you know, kind of thing. And so, um, yeah, it takes a lot of work to, to push stories in Nevada at the early stage. Great. Thank you. Um, so Greg has a question for all the panelists. He's asking, how does the panel feel about the use of new and advanced deeper geophysical technologies in Nevada, both undercover and under mines? Absolutely love it. Um, you know, Gobel, Gobel's VP of Exploration is a geophysicist, and that was a deliberate appointment because we feel that geophysics has a lot more um, discoveries to be made in this state. Uh, where we've had amazing su success both in Gobel and uh, at Hog Ranch, owned by Rex Minerals, using 3D IP. Uh, it's just it's directly correlated to new gold hits. So 3D IP um, is is probably our technique of choice. Um, if, we, if we're doing IP on a budget, we'll go CSAMT, but they're, they're two techniques uh, in particular that we will be deploying uh, on our current projects on, and also on our uh, Greenfields projects. We also love magnetics and gravity as ways to you know, map out what you can't see at the surface. So absolute huge fans of geophysics and think it's been really underutilized. And I, I do believe that this current generation, and I think that the panel here um, will be using more of it and making more discoveries from geophysics. Yeah, I, I think that really is part of being a sort of a next generation explorer is uh, utilizing all of the available techniques, uh, you know, uh, the, the state of the art geophysical techniques, but also doing that in the context of solid geology and uh, making sure you're, you know, leveraging your, your, your drill holes uh, to, to the best uh, that you can. So spending your money as wisely as possible often includes some geophysical component. Absolutely. Any other thoughts? Agree. Agreed. I, I agree with all of it. I mean, we, yeah. uh, like Caleb saying, we use a multidisciplinary approach. We we use every tool out there that we believe is appropriate for what we're targeting. And I really think the more data sets you're using, the better. Um, you can learn something from all of them. And as Caleb says, it all comes down to how, how do you drill the most efficiently? How do you use that capital the most efficiently? And geophysics is a huge part of that. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm, just, I'm conscious of time. I just wanted to wrap up with uh, giving you each the opportunity to discuss any upcoming catalysts that investors can look forward to uh, in regards to each of your companies. Starting with uh, you, Chad. Uh, yeah, so we have um, both metallurgy and permitting initiatives ongoing at uh, Selena right now. So we're hoping to have news out to the market in early Q4. Um, we're also drilling at Carlin East um, and hopefully we're gonna wrap that up in the next, I'm hoping uh, um, five to 10 days, get the everything cut and off to the lab and we'll hopefully have news um, late October, early November. So it should be an exciting fall. Thank you, Sheree. Uh, we have a lot of drilling scheduled uh, in Q4 at Sandman. We'll be drilling some high priority uh, conceptual feeder targets uh, to test for these bonanza loads at Sandman, um, drilling deeper between 200 to 400 metres. Um, previously, the project's been really focused on the top 100, so very excited to see whether we can find some of the roots of the mineralisation that we're seeing at surface. And we also will be drilling our Big Balls project, which is uh, a long strike of Bald Mountain Mine, and uh, that's a, a really early stage project that's been defined on geophysics where we're looking for essentially another board mountain type intrusive complex. Great. And Matt? Yeah, so we have about 10 holes left from our 2021 program that we'll be releasing um, in the next couple of weeks. Those will be from our alpha zone, um, which sits essentially midway between our two main new discoveries being X-ray and Tango. Um, we've got a lot of surface work going on at site at the moment, um, mapping, soil sampling, rock sampling, really to refine targeting on the for the next phase of drilling on those new discoveries. Um, and then we also have at least two large-scale new targets uh, called Whiskey and Foxtrot that we'll be looking to drill in that Q4, Q1 uh, window when we do get back out there with the drill. So lots going on at site. Um, I actually just got back. Uh, late last night, things look fantastic. Rock's looking good. It's uh, it, it's really exciting. Awesome. And Caleb? Yeah, so as I mentioned, we just finished up drilling on our Highland and Spring Peak projects. Uh, no assay results yet, but they should be uh, trickling in really any day now, and we'll have a stream of assays over the next six to eight weeks uh, that, that we'll be releasing. Uh, 
In addition to that, we have plans to drill two more projects uh, this year before the year end. And, uh, you know, we'll have a couple of uh, new project uh, acquisition uh, uh, announcements relatively soon. We've uh, continued to generate new opportunities within the portfolio, and we're, we're excited to, to uh, start talking about those. Great. Well, uh, that is all the time we have today. I just want to thank you all for uh, joining and for all your incredible insight and a great discussion. And thank you for whoever attended and asked them in all these great questions. If you have more questions, feel free to reach out to each of these companies directly and you can find more information on their website. Um, and as I said, this panel has been recorded, so you can rewatch um, the recording up on six.com.